It's my, my pleasure tonight to introduce the concluding lecturer in this three-part series on computers in the mind, Professor Donald Mackay. Before I tell you something about Professor Mackay in way of introduction, let me just add that though this is the concluding lecture, and this is all that was announced in the poster, the three participants have agreed to get together for a discussion, an open-ended discussion after an intermission following Professor Mackay's talk. So he will give his uh, presentation on brain, mind, and immortality. Then we'll have a very brief intermission, and then we'll have a discussion, not from the floor, there won't be time for that, but a discussion among uh, the three participants, Hillary Putnam and Seymour Papert and Donald Mackay. Donald Mackay is a ideal choice, it seems to me, as the concluding speaker of, the, of this uh, three-step series, because his interests uh, cover a very broad spectrum, encompassing the interests of the other two speakers and far beyond. He's a physicist. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he's a physicist, also interested in theology, and pretty much everything in between. Uh, he's written papers on communication theory, analog computing, information processing, brain and mind, freedom of action in a mechanistic universe, neural communications, and that's only a very small sampling from the, the uh, papers that he's done. And uh, even specifically, his work in... Uh, uh, artificial intelligence or his views on artificial intelligence uh, are very much in the middle between the two views that you've heard. Not only does he uh, span these wide extremes, but uh, the position he's held, I, as, as I understand it from the papers of his that I've read, is to see the attractiveness but the limitations of the digital model in artificial intelligence to see also the attraction and the limitations of the view that says there can't be any mechanized version of mentality, and to propose at times anyway that perhaps an analog computer or a wet engineering would be the solution to the problem, and to propose in detail ways that such an analog computer might operate in order to be intelligent. Now, I don't know whether he's going to talk about that tonight, but uh, maybe that will come up in the discussion. In any case, his, uh, his qualifications are excellent, and his topic is fascinating. He's going to talk on brain, mind, and immortality. Professor Mackay. I have to begin by passing the intelligence test, which my colleagues passed so distinct in such a distinguished way. Now, flunked it. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, uh, when our chairman asked me if I had a title, I confessed that uh, I hadn't. I was prepared to talk on computers and the mind, but um, I thought it was perhaps fair to describe my topic as brain, mind, and immortality because I felt challenged by Professor Stent's earlier remark that the aim of the lecture committee was to have someone take a modern view of the immortality of the soul. And I thought perhaps something on that uh, subject should be mentioned by the end at any rate of what I want to say. But I want to begin, as I think you'd want me to do, with our feet on the ground. And the question I'd like us to face to begin with is if we want to take data which are as solid as possible, what data would we use? And what I want to suggest, uh, we're going to need the blackboard. If we can have the lights, please. <laughs> uh, what I would suggest is that we begin with data which are so solid that we would be lying to deny them. And I'm going to put those data up in the form of a table, or at least I'm going to draw 
one or two of the entries in what I'm going to call the I story, which means the story that you and I would tell if somebody asked us to bear witness truthfully to what we are at the moment experiencing. For example, I see a room which is unnecessarily dark. I hear the sound <laughs> of my own voice. Uh, and um, things of that sort. I could set them out in the form, I see a room hyphenated there, I hear, and so forth. And these data, I say, are data which I can only bear witness to truthfully or else lie about. These are the sort of data to which all my thinking must do justice, the data of my conscious experience. And as a visual aid, I thought might be helpful if you feel as I do after a good dinner, uh, I'd like now to show you one example of the sort of data which um, I'll want to refer to later. Can we have first the movie, please? This is known uh, among my friends as the dullest movie ever made. <laughs> and uh, it is, in fact, just an artificial snowstorm. And I want you to verify that it's uniform in structure. Now we're going to throw on top of this a slide consisting of a pattern of regular near parallel lines, radial lines. Can we have the slide on top? I hope now, if we can have this on, uh, I hope you'll agree that the snowstorm has taken on a structure. And in fact, if you think about the direction of rotation of this pattern, I think you'll find it'll reverse. Yes? <laughs> now, each time you think about it, it'll tend to reverse. <laughs> and if we can have the slide removed, you can verify that this is not a trick played by the operator up there. Uh, this is, in fact, an example of control of what you think over what you see in a situation which is deliberately designed to be ambiguous. Thank you, that's all for the demonstration. Now, what does this imply for our um, I story? Well, in this case, we saw, I hope, uh, a rotating rosette or something like that. So a typical datum for each of us would be expressed by saying, I see a rosette rotating. I'm not going to refer to these afterwards, so don't worry if it's illegible at the back. The point I'm making is that this experience of yours was something which you would have been lying to deny, and moreover, something which you yourself were able to influence. So here is a simple example of the intimacy of our experience, our mental activity on the one hand, and the physical stimuli uh, arriving at our eyes. There's a complex, intimate interrelationship of those, but for the moment, the main point is that this is a typical entry in what I'm calling the I story. And you would know what it would have been to have lied if I had asked you, and in that sense, this was a strong datum. Now, the reason for choosing an illusion as the example is to make clear that I'm not talking about our perception of the real world as a datum. In other words, that I see a room full of people is a fact, is a datum, but whether or not the room is in fact full of people or whether I'm suffering a hallucination is an empirical open question. What I'm saying is that uh, my experience, my conscious experience, is the datum, and it's those conscious experiences of which, of course, uh, there are legion, uh, it's those conscious experiences which we describe in the terms that I'm calling the I story, because characteristically they're described in the first person. Now let's fill this out a little bit more. Uh, among the sort of things that we would say with our feet on the ground of solid data are such things as, um, I believe that Berkeley is in California, that 13 is a prime number, and so on. All of these are uh, hyphenated expressions. 
to which we can bear witness, uh, in which we bear witness, truthfully or otherwise. Um, we can also say, I'm weighing up pros and cons of some course of action, um, whether, for instance, to take a holiday or to go on working when the next official public uh, vacation comes along. And um, in that connection, we say things like, I think, or I am thinking. All of these, then, uh, are samples of what I'm calling the I story. Now, the point of putting it up like this is that in brain research, we're trying to fill out another story, which I'm going to call the brain story. And the working assumption of brain research is that corresponding to each entry in the I story, there is at least one kind of correlate in the brain story. And I'm going to distinguish between the neural brain story, that is to say, a description of what the nerve cells are doing, and another, which I'll come to in a moment. But the point is that if it's true that I am at the moment seeing a room, then certain things must, according to the assumption of brain science, certain things must be true of my visual nervous system, which would not be true if I were not seeing a room full of people. Uh, if it's true that you saw the thing going clockwise, then certain things ought to be true about your nervous system, which would have had to be different if your experience had been different. And in that sense, then, brain science is trying to find the neural correlates of the events of experience to which you bear witness in the I story. So I'll put in uh, just XXX there to indicate an immensely complicated story about nerve cells which would correspond to this and so on for each of those statements. Um, in particular, let's notice that the statement, I believe that 13 is a prime number or whatever, the brain scientist would hope is, uh, has as its correlate a statement about the state of conditional readiness of the programming section of the brain. Uh, in a particular part of the system, which for short, I think perhaps I'll write it in, uh, for short we'll call the cognitive system. Now let's define what we mean by the cognitive system here. Uh, we mean that system in the brain which must change if what I believe changes. So the cognitive system represents what I believe in the sense that no change can take place in what I believe without a corresponding change taking place in the cognitive system of the brain. Now I've put the label here under the neural heading, but of course there is another level of analysis or way of understanding what the brain is doing, and for short I'm going to call this the information processing level. By that I mean that we can look on a nerve cell not just as a physiological system uh, hiccuping electrically and sending its impulses down its fibers, but also as a communication element sending messages. And talking about it as sending messages is focusing on the information significance of what it's doing. And this leads to analysis of brain activity in terms of what's called information processing. Um, and, of course, there'll be corresponding stories to be told for each of those. And indeed, it might make more sense to describe the cognitive system uh, in information processing terms rather than in neural terms. You would get the point, as it were, uh, of describing a particular activity as representing uh, a belief I have or a change in what I believe uh, more readily by looking at the information processing uh, level of what's going on. It's the two are related in something of the way in which the meaning of what I've written up here as two words, I and story, uh, is related to the description in terms of the chalk that I've put on the board. They're, so to speak, complementary uh, correlates of one another. 
Now, so far, I've been talking about uh, brain science and human brains, and in a sense, I've been presupposing uh, much of the sort of thing that Professor Putnam uh, was saying earlier about these two being correlates and about a certain kind of autonomy which you expect to find at one level relative to another. But I have here to make a qualification of this point about it autonomy. In the first place, not all neural events have a correlate not all neural events in the brain story have a correlate in the eye story. There are many neural changes in the brain which do not have a correlate in experience. And indeed, more subtly still, there can be changes in the nervous system. For example, changes in the concentration of chemicals or things like that, which would have as their subjective correlate in terms of conscious experience, not so much uh, identifiable events so that a man could say, now it's this, now it's that, as you were able to say, now it's clockwise, now it's anticlockwise. Not that, but rather imperceptible changes in the probability that your thinking will go one way rather than another. For example, uh, certain kinds of drugs, of which alcohol is one, increase, perhaps imperceptibly, the probability that you will think of certain things as being a good idea. Now, <laughs> The point I'm making is that we mustn't assume that this autonomy is absolute. You can have changes which are best understood biochemically, but whose correlate is a change in the probability of events described in the I story. So the autonomy is not absolute, uh, uh, not as absolute as it might seem. And indeed, if we're going to think of the brain as a mechanism, I'm going to suggest we have to think of it as one where events of information processing significance may have to be understood first as purely physical events or purely chemical events, such as changes in chemical concentration affecting the overall statistical properties of the information processing system. There's an asymmetric relation between these two then, the information processing level and the neural level, and I've suggested that one should describe them, therefore, as hierarchically complementary. They're complementary to one another in the sense that when you've finished this story, you've missed the point of that one, unless you go back and start over again and read the significance in these terms. I sometimes use the analogy of the no smoking sign, where uh, you can, if you want to argue with the usher, uh, insist that it's nothing but paper with ink on it. And you can prove this. But if you think this entitles you to smoke, uh, he'll soon show you. Otherwise, he'll simply tell, him, tell you that you're missing the point at the top of your voice. So what I'm saying is the understanding of what's going on in the brain at the neural level misses the point systematically of what's going on at the information processing level. That's true. But the relationship is not symmetrical in the sense that there can indeed be changes at the neural level uh, perhaps the result of injection or some other uh, violence done to the system, which then have consequential changes at the information processing level. And there can even be and, and are uh, feedbacks, as it were, between the levels, uh, which make it quite difficult to separate those two in the way that might be tidy and is easier in the context of computers, as we'll see in a moment. In any case, the working assumption of brain research is that if we include environmental factors, and we must never leave these out, of course, the signals coming in through the sense organs and all, uh, if we include those, uh, then the system as a whole, the brain story as a whole, is a law-governed one, at least in a statistical sense. That's the working assumption, then, of brain research. Well, now, where do computers fit into this picture? I'm going to suggest that we should draw two more uh, columns and call this the computer story. And recognize, again, that there are two levels um, to a computer story. 
where a computer is being set up to imitate human behavior. Then there will be an electrical story. On the one hand, in terms of transistors flipping each other over into different states by electrical impulses and so on. And there will be an information processing, or let's be specific and say programming level, where what matters is the significance of these electrical flippings. And once again, the point is easily uh, seen that if you stuck to the electrical level, you would be missing what's true and important at the programming level in relation to the computer. Now, the point about a digital computer of the conventional sort is that the engineering is so uh, arranged and so uh, reliable that almost always these two are uh, methodologically precise correlates and separable or autonomous in the sense that Professor Putnam was indicating. In other words, you talk programming language and couldn't care less whether the computer works on electricity or uh, local water supply. And um, similarly, an electronic engineer services the machine by testing transistors and doesn't talk about the ill conditionness or otherwise of the equations that are being fed into it. So that there is a kind of autonomy here because of a rather rigorous relation between uh, the program level and the electrical level. But uh, I got interested in this field uh, back in the late 1940s by wondering what sort of capacities a rather more general sort of mechanism would have, namely a mechanism whose electrical hookup changed as a function of its own activity. Now, I don't want to bore you with the details of this. All I'm wanting to say is that it is possible to envisage something much more hairy than a well-behaved digital computer in which the electrical connections between elements and uh, perhaps more subtly still, the probabilities of electrical activation from one element to another uh, become a function of the ongoing program of activity, including the incoming signals from the uh, outside world. And a mechanism of this sort did indeed have, um, uh, did seem to have a very broad range of capacities greater than that of a straightforward digital computer in the kind of way that the range of numbers, uh, the full range of numbers, has a greater capacity than the range of integers. You can, in principle, of course, approximate two intervals between integers by using decimal notation and so on and still using numerals. But uh, if you take any given level of complexity, then a mechanism of the same complexity but with variable couplings is a more complex mechanism with a richer repertoire of capacities. And it was that kind of thing which I used as my weapon in arguing against uh, skeptical philosophers in the uh, late 40s, early 50s, who were inclined to say, uh, well, were inclined to search for things you could specify that a computer can never do. Um, my own position taken up then, which I've stuck to, is that uh, I don't know any way of getting round the general principle that as fast as you've specified what you want such a mechanism to do, even in statistical terms, i.e. in terms of probable reactions or relative probabilities of reactions of a given sort in given circumstances, um, once you've made the specification, then in a certain routine sense, you can turn that specification into a description of at least one kind of mechanism that will meet it. In other words, I think that uh, the way not to try to understand what, if anything, is mysterious about man uh, is to try to find a specification of behavior that you can't reproduce in a suitable general purpose artificial device. Now, um, that's, uh, as it were, an excuse, a historical excuse for my uh, taking an interest in this field, but it also uh, historically led me into the question, well, if a general purpose computer of this sort, where the electrical level becomes part of the programming level, where the hardware uh, changes its um, code as a function of the ongoing activity, has this uh, richness of ability, 
what sort of mechanism might the brain be? And evidence has piled up since then that the brain indeed does seem to be that sort of mechanism, not indeed uh, that the individual nerve cells are like the relays in a computer in any uh, precise sense, but in the sense that the connection pattern modifies itself uh, in the course of the activity, and in that sense, the code is constantly changing. Now, what about the question of thinking? Uh, none of us so far has raised the hairy old question, uh, can computers think? Let me just say uh, why I, at any rate, would regard this as um, a wrong-headed question. The word think appears in the I story. And I've been assuming, for the sake of argument, that there is a correlated brain story. So that if it's true that I'm thinking such and such, then certain things should be true about my brain cells or my information processing networks, which would be false if I were not thinking such and such. In that sense, I'm presupposing um, some sort of rigid correlation. But the point I want to make is that thinking belongs to the language of the I story. It is I who think, not my brain. And I've drawn up this parallel here to suggest that the proper comparison is not between minds and computers, but between brains and computers in this sense. Their hardware with the hardware and their information processing with their information processing. And that as it would be, in my view, a solecism to say my brain thinks, uh, because that would be a jump of category from the I story to the brain story. So it's equally a solecism to say that computers think. Uh, I may come back to that, but um, I think it's fair. And the point is that if we are interested in assessing the capacities of computers, we are not necessarily downgrading them relative to brains by denying that they think. We're only keeping the uh, only applying semantic hygiene, so to speak. <laughs> the capacity of the computer could be as great as that of the human brain or greater without justifying the claim that computers think. Well, that, of course, uh, would lead you, I think, fairly to the last question. Um, couldn't there then be an I story for computers? And um, this I'll be coming back to, but I want to mention it now because I take the view myself that there's nothing in what I've been saying so far which would justify us in denying the possibility that an artificially generated mechanism programmed in such a way as to reproduce the information processing functions of a brain uh, might not also be, by the same token perhaps, the brain of a conscious agent. But what I want to say for the moment is that it's very much an open question. So I'm just going to put question marks in there and uh, we'll see what time there is to come back to it. Now, there's been a good deal said already about uh, theories which seek to relate the powers of computers to various mathematical theorems and the pitfalls of doing so. I think that um, what I'd want to uh, say on the whole would be to press against um, this sort of downgrading of computers. Let me be honest, uh, I think all of my colleagues who are on the artificial intelligence side would agree that in terms of sheer complexity, the repertoire of the brain uh, may well be desperately beyond one man's lifetime capacity to um, program completely. And they might even agree that if you wanted to reproduce this, then you would have to do the um, programming partly in a form which was self-modifying so that it would be more economical to develop special purpose electrical devices to do the self-modification and so on. In other words, there are any number of inadequacies, I think they would agree, in the present state of artificial intelligence vis-a-vis -vis the target of producing, reproducing um, human performance. 
So I, I regard the question whether there could be an eye story for an artificial uh, human being as very much science fiction. But all I'm saying is uh, I don't see at the moment any philosophical or indeed theological uh, objection to that possibility. People sometimes say, uh, but surely the notion, even if it is science fiction, of imagining uh, somebody producing an artificial human being um, would, be to, uh, would uh, be to postulate usurping the creative power of God. But I think that certainly in terms of the uh, Christian doctrine of God as creator, if I understand it, this is just a misreading because human beings already have license and indeed responsibility in Christian theology, uh, responsibility for procreating, bringing new bodies into being which are organized neurally in such a way that uh, there is a conscious individual who has an I story to tell. And if indeed the um, artificial intelligence chaps were able to get the principles on which that process, that growth process, is mechanized into a form which they would think it worth uh, embodying, and if they did the job properly, uh, I would certainly want to say that we would uh, err on the safe side if we um, gave the resulting individual the credit for being uh, conscious as we are. But I do want to insist that this would be an open question, not one to settle by uh, dogmatic convention. Uh, if you want to see what I mean, just let's imagine that you were the individual who had been artificially brought into being, and that the rest of us had decided by convention that uh, for whatever reason, you were not conscious of us. What you would know as a fact, something you'd be lying to deny, is that we were wrong. <laughs> So that it is not a matter of convention whether a given individual is conscious. It is a question of fact. And therefore, if somebody produces an artificial human being uh, in the world of science fiction, uh, I would still want to insist that it would be a question of fact and not of convention whether that artificial human being uh, was conscious. There's been a good deal said um, in recent years about the problem of specifying the sort of program that would allow a computer to simulate uh, human mental processes. Uh, Michael Polanyi, for example, has, I think, very valuably uh, insisted that, as he puts it, we know more than we can tell, that there's a great uh, component of our knowledge, which is tacit, tacit in the sense that it only comes out by implication, and we don't know that we know it. And this point, um, I think, does bear on attempts to program computers on the basis of introspection, of thinking what it's like to do things. Uh, I've already made the point that the question, wha what I'll think of next, may be determined partly by some biochemical change in our nervous system, uh, as well as, or instead of, by a process of prior ratiocination. I mean, as long as you've got a logical drill in front of you, maybe what you've just thought determines what you think next. But by and large, what we think next comes into our heads, and the process by which it comes into our heads is not a process of deliberate calculation on our part. So in all kinds of ways, I would say that it's an obvious fact of experience that we both know more than we can tell, and also that factors of which we're consciously unaware uh, are, the, uh, are the determinants of what next comes into our minds, what next forms an entry uh, for the I story. But what I'd want to say is that although this sets limits to my power to specify how I think or to see law and rule in my thinking pattern, it doesn't, as far as I can see, set any limit in principle on an observer's finding law and rule to the information processing going on in my brain. Uh, Polanyi 
has pointed out that tacit knowledge is what we share with lower animals, and I think that's a fair case in point. A lower animal behaves as if it knew a lot of propositions, but it, by definition, knows more than it can tell because it can't tell us anything. But we, who observe its behavior, can infer from its behavior, or I suppose in principle could infer from the state of its nervous system if we could open it up, uh, that it has this knowledge and that it has a great deal more, and that there's information of a, of a subconscious sort built into various connection patterns, and so on. We could tell, in other words, what the animal can't tell, it knows. And in this sense, I'm suggesting that the fact that you and I know more than we can tell sets no barrier in principle to the possibility that an observer of our brains could tell what it is we know. I'm suggesting then that, um, although I respect the point that Polanyi is making, and I think it's been neglected, uh, it doesn't set an ultimate barrier of principle to mechanistic, law-like, understanding of thinking. But it's very important, uh, perhaps, to dwell on it, because people talk, for instance, about computerized decision-making uh, sometimes as if the problem is just one of finding out the rules that people use when they make decisions and then programming them into a computer. Now, if uh, Polanyi and Sir Geoffrey Vickers and others who've thought about this are right, the process by which a man or a committee reaches a decision involves tacit ingredients which will not be obvious to them, and in that sense, their thinking is not rule-following. They do not think by rule in the sense that there is a rule which, if only they followed it, would lead them to the conclusion. They do not follow the rule. But the point I'm making is that this does not imply that there is no rule by which the succession of events follow one another. The rule by which the events follow one another might be apparent to an observer in principle, even though the individual uh, in whose mind the events follow one another is not producing that sequence by consciously uh, following a rule. So what I'm suggesting is that we must um, take seriously various warnings against over-simple approaches to artificial intelligence designed to imitate the human, and that uh, there are certain things which, as far as I can see, uh, you wouldn't expect to be able to achieve if you started from just the entries that we call reports of thoughts. In the I story, you might have to dig down to one of the other levels which are um, causally bound up with the process, but that this, as far as I can see, doesn't at all suggest that the human brain process is not mechanical, uh, or indeed that one couldn't have an artificial brain. It would be more than a computer. It would be a hierarchy of computers with various evaluators and so on in uh, an evaluative hierarchy. Um, it doesn't mean that we couldn't have an artificial uh, automaton uh, organized on the same principles and able to uh, perform the same sorts of function. Turing's theorem uh, has been referred to, the theorem which says that any uh, precisely specified test can be uh, ipso facto programmed on a digital machine. Um, this is often, or used to be often, misinterpreted as meaning that anything uh, a human being can do, a machine can do. What I'm suggesting is that the limit to the capacity of uh, a Turing machine or any other explicitly programmed machine is our ability to make explicit what it is we want the machine to do. It's our understanding of what it is to be a man that sets the limits to the capacity of Turing uh, or any other explicitly programmed machine. Uh, and Turing's theorem doesn't, of course, tell us at all uh, how to find the set of tests which could be implemented in the form of rules for machine behavior. While I'm on the subject of theorems, Gödel's theorem is often invoked as another sort of embarrassment to those who would understand human behavior mechanistically. Uh, Gödel's theorem, which suggests that for any formal system, um, there must be at least one uh, statement which 
is not decidably true or false within the system, but which uh, an observer of the system or user outside the system could see to be uh, true. Uh, this has been sometimes um, suggested as setting uh, human beings apart from machines as superior to them. But as uh, Kenny and Blongett Higgins pointed out in a recent symposium um, of Gifford lectures, um, all this does is to show that one information processing system can always see to be true something which another information processing system is unable for itself to prove to be true. Uh, it would apply just as readily uh, between one man and another man, uh, or indeed between a computer and a man, as between a man and a computer. Well now, let me move to the three questions which it seems to me um, people might be interested in um, working out uh, under the general heading of our symposium. Uh, they've in part been touched upon by earlier speakers. We didn't uh, have collusion before we presented our talks, so that uh, forgive some overlap. I've already referred to the question, um, doesn't this mean that we could, in principle, build an artifact which had an I story? And the suggestion that I've been making is that we should leave this an open question. It's baseless speculation, uh, in a sense, because we don't yet know what difficulties lie ahead of making an artificial mechanism with similar information processing functions to a brain. It could well be, for example, that if you wanted the right combination of mobility and uh, weight and time constant and so on, uh, the mechanism you'd have to use would be um, protoplasm and the structure would be the structure of the human brain. And then the question might be, why not just produce it by unskilled labor in the good old way, uh, <laughs> rather than go to all this trouble of artificially engineering it? But let me insist again that I do regard it as a real question, not a pseudo question, whether such a device, if uh, implemented, uh, would itself be conscious in the way that you and I are and would be lying to deny. But let me come on to perhaps a much more important question. What room would there be in the view that I've been setting out, the view that mind talk and brain talk are hierarchically complementary for the causal efficacy of mind, as we traditionally uh, might have called it. Professor Putnam has elegantly exposed the fallacy of what I like to call nothing buttery, which is the argument that if you can find a complete story at one level uh, with all its causal chains um, forming a tight mesh, then you have given all the explanation that's necessary. The example of the no smoking sign is, of course, um, fair enough as an illustration of nothing buttery. The chap who thinks that he can debunk the prohibition of smoking by proving that there's nothing there but ink on paper is a classical example of the nothing butter. And I'm suggesting that the person who says that mind is debunked by finding a complete explanation in one or other or both together of these terms uh, is similarly uh, guilty of uh, a fallacy. But this doesn't of itself dispose of the question whether what I think has any, quote, real efficacy. And uh, I'd like to spend a minute saying why I think that indeed um, what we think does and that there is no tendency in mechanistic explanation to eliminate this. And the easiest way to come back uh, to do this is to come back to the cognitive system which I described here. The usual argument for the inefficacy of mind you know, mind nothing but an epiphenomenon or something like that, uh, would run that if the brain story were complete in its own terms and therefore every event in it had its causes in and of the brain story itself, then clearly whatever I think, believe and so on uh, can only be, as it were, floating along as an ineffectual extra if that. 
there must already exist, before I make up my mind, when I'm weighing pros and cons, the notion is, if this, is, if this were, let's say, a physically determinate system, then there must already exist, before I've made up my mind, a specification of the outcome, already fixed and determinate, which I'm just ignorant of, and as a result of my ignorance, I feel free. Now, what I want to suggest is that when you look into the implications of brain mechanics itself, that's to say of the assumption that there's a neural correlate of each entry in the I story, uh, that argument is fallacious. Take a specification of the cognitive system, of your cognitive system, which at this moment would represent fully what you believe. You remember we defined it as that system in your brain which would have to change if any change took place in what you believed. It represents what you believe in that any change in what you believe is reflected by a change in the cognitive system. Consider the specification of that system that a detached scientist I mean, a non-participant scientist just observing you could, in principle, produce. Let's call that specification S. Now, that specification, he is correct to believe if he's done his job properly. Question, would you be correct to believe it? Well, let's remember what it specifies. It specifies the state of a system which must change if any change takes place in what you believe. Therefore, either S is correct now, in which case, if you believed it, your brain would change and S would become incorrect. So S is not something you'd be correct to believe. Or I might, if I were clever enough, and if um, the logic of the situation were kind to me, I might be able to cook up a specification, um, let's call it S prime, which at the moment is incorrect, but which would become correct, provided you believed it. Your believing it would require a change in your brain, and S prime would be so cooked up that the change in your brain correlated with your believing it would just make S prime correct. Well, in that case, you would be correct to believe S prime, but you would not be in error if you disbelieved it, because it is incorrect unless you believe it. Now, you see the point. The state of your cognitive system does not admit of fully determinate specification in a form which you would be correct to believe and mistaken to disbelieve, whether you know it or not. This has some relation uh, to the paradox that um, Professor Papert referred to, but uh, it's, I hope you'll notice this is not uh, a matter of what happens if I predict what you're going to do. It's nothing to do with that. It's an empirical uh, matter in the sense that we empirically believe that changes have to take place in the brain if changes take place in what we believe. But it's a logical matter in the sense that if you grant that correlation, which is what brain science is all about, then logically there cannot exist a complete specification of the, of the present state of your cognitive system with an unconditional claim to your assent, whether you know it or not, or if only you knew it, such that if only you knew it, this is what you would be correct to believe and mistaken to disbelieve. Instead, the logical truth of the matter, granted the correlation, is that the correctness of S or S prime is up to you. It is up to you whether S prime is correct, even if your brain were as mechanical as clockwork. So in parenthesis, this argument says nothing whatever against the possibility of computer imitation of brain function. I don't know whether Professor Papert thought it did, but it doesn't. It says nothing whatever against the possibility of computer imitation of brain function. What it does say is that even if your brain were a computer, in the sense of a determinate uh, Turing machine or whatever, uh, there cannot exist a complete specification of its cognitive mechanism with an unconditional claim to your assent, you whose brain it is. And by the same token, the immediate future of your cognitive system has no specification. This is an ontological point, you see, not an epistemological point. I'm not saying you cannot find out what the state of the system is. 
or what the future state will be. I'm saying there doesn't exist, unknown to you, a specification of your future which, if only you knew it, you would be correct to believe and mistaken to disbelieve. In that sense, then, not merely the present state of your cognitive system, but the future, the immediate future state of those uh, aspects of brain function which are causally linked with the cognitive system in the appropriate way, is indeterminate. Indeterminate, not in the sense of breaking physical laws, of course, scientifically determinate, if you like, physically determinate, but what I've called it is logically indeterminate, in the sense of their of having no specification, having no specification, with a well-founded, unconditional, take it or leave it, claim to your assent, if only you knew it. That's the sense, then, in which what you think not merely can have some uh, say in the future of the eye story and the brain story, but must have some say. Sometimes it may be a trivial say. But the future of your brain cannot be the same regardless of what you think about it. It's one way of putting it. And therefore, in a very obvious sense, then, what we've commonly supposed to be uh, the relation of our mind to our action is, as far as I can see, untouched by the hypothesis that our brains are complex uh, mechanisms in the general family of um, computing mechanisms. This, uh, as you will see, uh, introduces a necessary element of relativity between what an observer would be correct to believe about your brain and what you yourself would be correct to believe. I want to underline that because if you don't see the relativistic aspect of this, then it sounds like a contradiction or paradox in the, in the bad sense. The point I'm making is that it necessarily makes a difference who believes where the belief is a belief about a believer. All right? It necess where, where the belief in question is a belief about a cognitive agent, then the correctness or otherwise of the belief in general depends on who believes it. The imaginary scientist who had the belief expressed by the specification S, I believe that, the cognitive system, that your cognitive system is in state S, he was not incorrect in having that belief. He would only have been incorrect if he imagined that that was the belief that you would have been correct to share. It's necessary that his belief should not be the same as yours in order that you should both be justified in what you believe. It's necessary that you should not believe what he does in order that what he believes should not be false. Because if you believed it, S would in fact change and S, there, I mean the brain would change and therefore S could not be correct. So you see what I'm saying? When you come to talk about, <laughs> when you come to talk about human agents, you have to recognize that what a detached onlooker may believe about the agent's brain, uh, viewed either neurally or in terms of information processing, is not identical with what the agent himself would be correct to believe if only he knew it. There is a relativity between the two. Notice, though, that this relativity doesn't mean that there's an arbitrary connection between them. It doesn't mean, in other words, that regardless, what, uh, regardless of what a scientist believes about my brain, I can believe what I like. It doesn't mean that at all. There is postulated to be a rigorous connection between the two. But the connection is not one of identity. On the contrary, there cannot, there does not exist a specification which would provide an identical correct belief both for you and for the detached onlooker. Finally then, uh, what of the concept of the immortality of the soul? If all my experience correlates in the way that I've been imagining for the sake of this argument um, and in the way that is the working hypothesis of brain science, which is my own field, if all our experience correlates with the activity of a physical mechanism inside our heads, then surely death, 
which means the destruction of this mechanism, must also mean the end of my experience. Doesn't this then uh, completely eliminate any idea of the immortality of the soul? Well, I think this, as far as I can see, would certainly might uh, weaken grounds for the sort of belief that's based on inexplicability of behavior in physical terms. I mean, if you have what you might call rudely uh, an invisible man model of the human being. Uh, you remember H.G. Wells' story, was it, of the invisible man? And in a modern setting, you could, you could imagine him at the wheel of a car, and there's the car driving along, and the steering wheels turning, and the accelerator pedals being pushed, and there's no driver visible. Now, if that's what one meant by the soul, the invisible man that's believed to be in the brain, then certainly uh, a brain story which was complete in its own terms and didn't invoke any such thing, in which the steering wheel was moved by other forces, uh, themselves causally related to the rest of the system, um, an invisible man model in that sense would have a hard time. But if what we're concerned with is what I understand as the theistic concept, uh, then the picture is quite different. To begin with, uh, I think I'm right in saying that the biblical concept of the soul, which was referred to earlier by Professor Putnam, is such that it is not correct to say that we have souls. The belief is that we are souls. Man became a living soul. A soul is something you become. And from this point of view, uh, the theistic doctrine seems not merely compatible with mechanistic ex explicability, mechanistic brain science, but entirely hospitable to it. The personality which is expressed by our choosing uh, and all the other things to which we can bear witness in the I story is the personality of one who is described theologically as a living soul, as one who is accountable to God and so on, um, not on the grounds that there's something loose in the works of the brain, but on the grounds that when you've finished with the brain story, you have missed the point of what is going on, unless you see it also as the activity of a conscious being who knows certain things, is accountable for certain choices, and so on, at the level at which these choices uh, are expressed. In other words, you test the man's accountability in terms of the entries in the I story itself. Now, in passing, there isn't time to elaborate on this, uh, there will obviously be pathological cases where the couplings in the normal brain are disrupted in such a way that the individual is not uh, properly held accountable for what he does. Uh, in particular, you can see from the form of this uh, logical indeterminacy uh, proof that I gave just now, that if the couplings between the cognitive system and the system which determines priorities, the normative system, were broken or overridden, then there would exist in principle specifications of the future activity of that system with a well-founded, unconditional claim to the assent of the individual whose brain it is. Do you see what I'm saying? If there's a brain pathology such that the cognitive system ceases to be functionally effective in the chain of command, so to speak, then the logical indeterminacy of the cognitive system to the agent does not imply logical indeterminacy of actions, of the actions of the agent, because the actions no longer depend causally on the cognitive system. So um, there is, uh, within this view, uh, all the room that I think is needed for doctrines of diminished responsibility in cases of brain pathology. But leaving those on one side, what I'm saying is that my accountability for my actions is something to be settled in terms of what I knew, believed, uh, had to uh, weigh up by way of pros and cons, and so forth. And the existence of a complementary causal story in brain language uh, in no way diminishes 
that responsibility unless it can, in principle, produce a specification of that action which I would have been unconditionally correct to believe if only I had known it. And in general, given that the cognitive system is doing its job, that won't be the case. So then, what of immortality? I've said that we would indeed <clears throat> expect the destruction of the brain to be the end of conscious experience. But if being a soul implies, essentially, having certain structural properties, functional structural properties, which determine uh, what kinds of relation uh, we enter into with others, uh, corresponding, for example, to what I remember, uh, what I like or dislike, uh, who I know, whom I love, whom I hate, or whatever. If that's what defines me as an individual, then, of course, the question of immortality in the Christian theistic sense is, as I see it, as wide open as ever it was. Again, I think I'm echoing here what Professor Putnam said. If it be true that God is prepared to raise us in a re-embodiment, in a resurrection embodiment, to give expression to the same personality in a new embodiment, then, to put it uh, mildly, uh, he will have no more problem in doing so than you or I would have if we had a computer uh, solving a certain program, uh, working through a certain program, and let's say there's uh, an accident which destroys the computer, and we want the same program to be run again. I'm not suggesting that the analogy is uh, complete. Indeed, it's uh, obviously limited in many ways. But I am saying that if the essence of what it is to be a living soul is to have a truthful I story, including such things as one's capacity to uh, take decisions, enter into relationships, and so on. Then, if there is a doctrine which says that God is prepared to give us this capacity again in a new embodiment, there's nothing in what I've been saying here, uh, as I see it, which would militate against this in the least. The question, of course, uh, is raised of continuity. And there are philosophers who've been making heavy weather of it, suggesting that uh, we'd never be able to tell whether in the resurrection uh, this was the same individual or else some kind of replica. Uh, I think there are two uh, brief answers to this. Uh, the first is that if it's the creator who is doing the, the recreating, then presumably uh, he's the one who determines who his creatures are. The second is that if you're going to make heavy weather of that, it seems to me you have logically a similar sort of heavy weather to make of the question of your identity when you wake up tomorrow morning with the individual who went to bed tonight. In other words, the problem of waking up to a new situation and still being the same person is, of course, not a trivial problem. All I'm saying is that, as I see it, the theistic doctrine of eternal life, which is involved in the resurrection of the body and so on, and not in the uh, persistence of a, of a ghostly driver uh, in the chariot of the brain, uh, the biblical theistic doctrine, as far as I can see, doesn't raise in principle uh, an additional problem to the problem of the continuity of personal identity uh, in waking up from sleep uh, in our day-to-day -day experience. And finally, the point I would make is that this belief, this uh, biblical theistic belief, is based not on gaps in science, so that hunting around for queer extrasensory experiences and so on, as far as I can see, would be irrelevant to it. The belief that God is prepared to re-embody those uh, who know him um, is something which is based, as I say, not on doctrines of queer goings on in the brain, gaps in science. It's based on a promise, plus what a Christ the Christian believes to be, uh, so to speak, a worked example 
in the resurrection of Christ. So that it's, uh, as I read Christian theology, it would be quite wrong-headed to try to support the Christian doctrine of the immortality of the soul by attacking mechanistic understanding of the brain or indeed uh, by attacking attempts by uh, artificial intelligence people to try to simulate human capacities. Let me then briefly summarize. I've suggested first that it's essential to sort our concepts in this area for the standpoint from which they're valid and defined and for the level, whether we're talking at the information processing level, at the neural level, or whether we're using concepts from the, the I story. And also whether we're using concepts defined from the standpoint of a detached observer or from the standpoint of the agent himself. You'll have noticed that I've concentrated on activities and events as basic concepts rather than uh, material stuffs and entities. Again, perhaps this is in line with what Professor Putnam was saying. Linking events in the eye story with events in the brain story, it seems to me, is uh, a reasonable thing to attempt where linking entities in the two uh, is methodologically uh, nearly always totally obscure. I've suggested that I don't know any sound reason in philosophy or in biblical theism for denying a priori that our brains may be machines in some sense, and that those of us who wish to defend the dignity of man and the hope of immortality uh, must beware of attacking the wrong target, attacking mechanistic explanation, instead of attacking the nothing buttery presuppositions with which those who wish to disbelieve in these concepts sometimes try to defend themselves. If we attack and see through the nothing buttery, then it seems to me we can let the facts emerge peacefully where they will and as they will.